Well, thank you very much to all of you for coming. And this title, and by the way, this question, uh, is quite fundamental. So when you're doing economics, you go straight forward like, oh, what, uh, which are the best markets that we can implement? Which are the institutions? Which is everything? But how ca about we ask basic questions like, what is a market? Why do we exchange things? And in particular, when we talk about diamonds and water, something odd is happening because water is vital. We cannot live without water, but we can live without diamonds. However, it seems that in the actual society, diamonds are more valuable than water. And why? Anyone has any idea? Any thoughts about it? Yeah? Scarcity of diamonds. Scarcity can be a factor. However, scarcity is an odd factor. Just for the matter of purpose, I will do the following. So I'm painting a lovely drawing here. And let's put even some ocean. This is my artistic skill. Don't spec more than that, please. Um, it's super scarce. It's the unique of his type. How much are you willing to pay? Any other suggestion? I mean, I can be vast yet, and then they began to take it out of the walls to sell it, but I think this is not my case. Demand. Demand. There should be someone that like it. Yeah, it's kind of precondition, but. The production cost. Production cost. So we can decide how many time I expend. Uh, let's say that I decide to expend time doing each little leaf of the grass, of the blue grass in this case, the green grass. And it will be costly because it will cost me the marker, it will cost me the lines, it will cost me my time. How much are you willing to pay for this? It's odd. So the main idea here is that those answers that you are giving were well known before, even were well known by Smith. By his moment, there was an important economist in Italy, Galliani, and he wrote in uh, 1751 a treaty of uh, money. And he already talked about these things. And he said, yes, it's a scarcity, because think of the last uh, glass of water in the desert. It would be super valuable. But those are very extreme cases. Clearly, scarcity can give you some ideas of if it's more or less expensive than you want it to be. But to some extent, you have to have a previous idea. Another option that was also in that time uh, is if people want it the utility, the happiness they can derive from it. Um, but that's also not common. So another, and this was from French, from sensualists, they say, if I want something, the value is how much I want that thing. However, when we go to the market, we might not like everything, but we can agree there's a price for it. Uh, to give a particular example, once I was teaching a class, and to do a little kind of a contest, I offer a Hershey's. And one girl in my class, being smart, she said, oh, but I don't like chocolate. That price is not valid for me. To which I reply, it's not a matter if it's valid for you. If you win it, you can change it for something else because other people like it. So notice that even if the utility or the happiness that that person derived from chocolate is zero, it still has a value. And that's what the Smith was saying. You can have a price in the market that we are going to call for the moment the market price. So the price of the market. And it has things. It depends. It fluctuates. It depends on scarcity. It depends on fashion. It depends on demand, if there's someone willing to buy it. But there's a natural price that we have in our minds. So. There's something that the thing has, and then we take it to the market. And yes, there are some frictions, there are some things going on that is not exactly this, but we expect this one to gravitate around this one. So we have the natural price, this price, and the other price oscillating. Not necessarily convergence. This is not that we are going to end up in the right place. Think of the economy. We always see cycles. But somehow we expect to be around the real value. And the question is, what is that value? 
Smith gave a very particular answer to his moment, and he said, the value of a thing is how much labor you can command from it. In practical terms, how much are you willing uh, to give me if you have this marker? How much are you willing to give me if you have a diamond? How much labor I can command from you? So for example, if I have a diamond, you want it, and I say, can you do my homework? I'm commanding your labor. And that is the point of Smith. But to understand it better, we have to go a little bit uh, beyond and also one step back and ask, what is a person for Smith? Why is commanding important? And for Smith, people are simple in the sense we can describe them easily, although they can generate very complex behavior. People have an objective. So what is a person? A person has an objective, and the thing that everyone likes the most is not to be loved, but to be lovable. It doesn't matter if everyone loves you or not. That will depend on the people. But if you don't feel that people can love you, you kind of feel pretty bad with yourself. Indeed, what is the thing you like the least is not to be hated, is to be hateable. Let's see. So, yes, it's true, someone can hate you. There are things in life that people don't like. But if you feel that you are worth to be hated, you can feel very bad about yourself. So this is a human. Human like to be in this scenario, they don't like to be in this scenario. And how do we compare with each other? Well, there is a mechanism, a very lovely mechanism, that is sympathy. Sympathy is our ability to be in the feet of, in the shoes of the other person. So, and this is related to this metaphor that Locke says, like, if they tell you, you want to lose one finger or your family will be dead, you may say, eh, I can lose my finger, don't pro no worries. But if they tell you, you can lose your finger or hundred of hundred people in the other side of the world will be dead, you kind of think it twice. You cannot identify with them. This is the key word, identification. Because if people can identify with you and agree with you, you are lovable. You have the right to be loved. If people don't identify with you or identify negatively, you are hateable. <coughs> this is what you want. And because of that, humans have a derived two tendencies. Tendency number one, we like to persuade. Every single activity, every single thing we do, even me here now, I'm persuading you of this comment. When we are talking in a friendly way, we are trying to convince others from our arguments. We are trying others to identify with ourselves. We are convincing others. And the other one is to improve our position. Why? Because we want to be lovable, and if we improve our position, um, let's say upgrade, if we improve our position, people will like us more. People identify with the rich, with the happy people. You don't identify with the poor, with the homeless, with the beggar man that is in the street, because when you put on his shoes, you will be sad. Instead, if you are in the shoes of a happy person in a nice party, you will be happy. So you want to promote. Indeed, Smith has a very nice story about this upgrade, and he is the parable of the son of the poor man. So he described in Scotland, because well, he was from there, and he said, imagine the son of the poor man, where his father worked all the day, all the night to bring him food, got to his home tired, exhausted, even a little bit grumpy, and the son is uh, watching that. Which is the feeling that that son has for his father. Like, I don't want to be like him, I don't want to suffer that much, I don't want, like, it's not a nice option for me, it's not a nice role model. Instead, this son that is not still working, go to the village and see the rich man in the village. Full of parties, everyone liking him, is great, is in a good mood. He say, I want to be like the rich. So what does the son of the poor man do? He began to work and work hard. 
and worked hard all his life trying to improve his position. Although, and keep on the Smith parable, uh, he will end up like his father because he dedicated all his life to this illusion of working hard, trying to have sympathy, or, or mean because of the sympathy he has towards the rich man, and he loses all his life working. Um, this is a comment, but this is due to Smith. He said that what he really wanted was a lovely place in the mountains to be calm, but some people argue that that was because Smith was a Scottish, so he liked the <laughs> mountain. But independent of what he wanted is identification. Think of this in a drastic way. When you are walking in the streets and you see a homeless or a beggar man, and sometimes you prefer to keep on walking, you don't want to see him, you don't want to feel in his steps, you feel uncomfortable with yourself. That is kind of the underlying idea. So, why is this important? Because we associate culturally, historically, some objects to these things. If you have a diamond, it's because you are, have power, it's because you are rich, it's because you are wealthy, it's because it gives you a status. If you are the guy with the diamond, people can identify with you. And because of that, because it can give you some positions in society, you are willing to give a lot of things for that. You are willing to give your effort, you are willing to give your time, all those. So, this was the basic uh, answer of Smith up till now. Um, and yeah, that, that's basically commanded labor. So, I have these that create position that you wanted, you want to be identified, you want to be happy, I can give you the power. Um, but where does this power come from? It's a social consensus. My drawing, no social consensus. I mean, social consensus, <laughs> not valid. <laughs> and I agree, I'm not worried about that. But think of, for example, uh, Basquiat, Basquiat the painter. To some extent, his paintings were not too different than mine. Um, no, really, I mean, who haven't seen it, look, of it, look for him in Google. But suddenly he began to get very appreciated, all his graffiti style. And people began to take out the pieces of wall of the graffiti as a collection. Why? Because Andy Warhol said, wow, this guy is very skillful, he's talent, so it's prestigious to have a piece of art of Basquiat. You never know when this can become valid. But, uh, um, so, he said, how, another way to understand commanded, let's go to the rude and primitive times. So let's imagine an abstract society, a very naive society of hunter-gatherers. So we have a guy, and these guys live almost in utterly. They basically do, can do all of them by themselves. So this guy has his piece of land. He has his materials to work with his tools. And he also, okay, this L is his for his work, for labor, uh, capital, and land that I will call tree. Um, so the same guy has possession of all of them. And I decide, because I have my land, to, to produce corn. But I don't only want corn, I might need other things. So there's another guy, hunter-gatherer, and he used his tools, his labor, and his capital uh, uh, to hunt rabbits. So in that case, in this precise particular scenario, which would be the value? The value is he doesn't have to produce corn, he doesn't have to spend that time, he doesn't have to take those pains. I can relieve them from those pains if he give me some food. And then you began to see where this value appear. It's an exchange of equivalence classes. However, this is a very primitive society in which capital, labor, and land uh, are in the same person. But we know that nowadays that is totally disentangled. Some people are the owners of the land, some people are the owner of the capital, and some people have labor. So uh, the question is, is the value this? Not really. Value comes from what we in the society decide can command power, and this is how we split the price. And that is a very important distinction. This 
is not adding value, this is splitting the value. Which part are we paying for? So this is the famous theory of the components. So once again, just to make it clear, because now I'm going to pass to Ricardo, which is the answer for Smith? Smith is, we decide as a society, because our history, because our common culture, because anything, how much are we willing to give for an object? We have a common measure, it's not subjective for my perspective, it's not subjective for George's perspective, because maybe someone liked this drawing, but our consensus is that no one wants it. Maybe that student that I have don't like Hershey's, but the consensus is that Hershey's was a likable good. You can exchange it. So by consensus, you define the value, and then once you send it to the market, it is split it in the three parts. Ricardo didn't read this part very well. He said, how come? Commanded? Commanded is basically the most subjective thing you can do because it's how much are you willing to command or how much is he willing to command? So he just decided to omit the part of social consensus. It was very personal. And he didn't like this. He didn't like this because he was a little bit obsessed with Newton and he wanted to find unique objective measures, measurements. He wanted to say, I can measure work in this way. Well, he said, Smith, got crazy with that, but he got the idea very well here. Uh, in the rude and primitive times, the person changed his labor, how much time is he willing to put, for how much time is the other willing to put. So which would be the ideal unit, Ricardo? Incorporated value, incorporated labor. So the value of the diamond would be how much time I have to spend extracting the diamond. The, diamond, the value of my drawing is how much labor I have to incorporate in my drawing. We might not like it, in particularly, doesn't matter how much labor I incorporate, it will not be valuable. But for Ricardo it was. So things that have more labor on it, that have more work, have more value. Things that have less, have less value, and because you can measure it. Uh, comment aside, Ricardo was not silly. He was not going to criticize himself for the same. So he was not measuring, measuring my labor or your labor. It was like the social accepted labor, okay? So we agree among us that this drawing takes 0 0.5 seconds. And we agree among us that extracting a diamond takes two days. So now we have an equivalence measure of how much drawings I can exchange for a diamond. But then Ricardo was a businessman. He did theory, it was great, but it was theory for him being a businessman. And this is a very important difference because nowadays most of the economists <coughs> claim objectiveness, uh, hide their prejudices in the models. He didn't care for that, he was a businessman. So uh, this was his concern because we say, okay, Labor, the value of the object is how much labor we have to put on it. But unfortunately, we have to split it between the worker, uh, between the capitalist, this is a good guy for him, and between the landlord. How can we change a little bit this argument? And in his time, there were two important events going on at the same moment. So, um, you have to split this in three. You have the price. And England um, had some fights with Napoleon in the time of Napoleon, clearly. And they said, okay, we are going to attack France, but not by not letting them import, by not buying from them corn. So those, those were the corn laws. Um, Wheat, maize, basically grains, corns, generic. Um, what happened? So in this point, uh, Ricardo was arguing with another, a friend of him, 
Malthus from Jesus College, uh, Reverend Malthus. Um, and they said, the question is, should we keep on the restriction of, on corn or should we remove it? And the argument is the following. So where does the rent come from? OK, because you have capital is the rent of capital, worker is the wage, and this rent for land, why? So the theory they said is the following. Let's say we have original England and Marshalls everywhere. So we have the city and the good land. And I began to produce here. So I rent this land to the landlord and say, ah, hey, can I produce here? And he will say, yes, of course. Can he charge me? No, because this is also productive. So if he managed to charge me a little bit, I will say, I produce here. So people began to produce, 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 and no one can charge. But then population began to grow. Think Malthus, population growing. And the land ran out of land. So now we have to use the second uh, stage of land. And then let's say that this one produced 100, but this one only produced 95. So I go here and I say, OK, can I produce in your land? And this guy cannot say anything because I can produce them here. But this guy says, you have to pay me five. Why you have to pay me five? Because if you don't work here, you will be five units less productive. <laughs> so the rent is because of the monopoly of land. And the rent is the differential measure between land. So then we have to go to the next layer, 90. People working here, they don't pay rent. People working here has to pay now five. And people here have to pay 10. Consequence, England has no wildlife. Everything is fields, our fields. But the other consequence, as you can imagine, uh, the price of land was enormous. It was very expensive to produce land. But if we manage to trade with France, the marginal land would not be the marginal land in, in England. It would be the marginal land in France. And France has land. Um, so we can remove this. And now we can spread the price just in the capitalist and the worker. This theory, by the way, is from Malthus. So they agree in the theory, but Malthus has a different perspective. And the different perspective is because, as Kirk says, you need someone to buy things. And landlords might be useless in the sense they are not doing anything and they are just getting the money because they have the monopoly of the land but they are buying things. And when you buy things, you make your economy work. You are producing things. So having, uh, let's say, a luxurious class, a class that only spend, is also good for the economy. They are making it move. Uh, Malthus lose that argument. So after a while, they removed the corn laws, and Ricardo was happy. Unfortunately, he was dead, by the way, by that time. But, but he would have been happy. Second issue of Ricardo. Now we have wages to spread. And there was a second debate that, so in this case, Ricardo was against Malthus. In this second case, Ricardo was with Malthus. Second case is the poor's law. How can we treat the poor people? Should we care for them to begin with? Should we have a welfare kind of state? Um, following Malthus is tough. It's tough because people in that time, well, they have nothing more than themselves. There was no TV, no radio. So in order to entertain themselves, they will have more kids. And by having more kids, well, 
their wage will not be enough, so they will starve and people will die, and that is a bad thing. Uh, and the problem is if we help them, because if we help them, they don't see themselves to be constrained, so they will keep on this happy life, and then when they have a lot of kids, we will have issues. This is one cartoon perspective, but it's not so different, his argument. Uh, the only reason why he has to do a different argument is because he was a priest. So you should not suggest reduction of population if you're a priest. Um, however, that was the point. Uh, the Earth has a limit. Uh, we can be having more people than the one we can produce, so that will create a lot of famine, and in order to avoid that catastrophe, uh, we can protect it now by give them the minimum to live, exactly enough, uh, so they just can stay in the level. Talking about this, uh, this level uh, is context specific. So for example, if we are talking about the minimum level to live in France, wine is important. If we are talking the minimum level in Italy, oil would be important. If we are talking the minimum level in the UK, you can say what's important. Um, but yeah, the, the social culture was important because these humans are integral. So it's not like just let's measure the caloric income you have to have things they like. Um, so solution, if we don't want to create these catastrophic scenarios for the poor people, the best thing we can do, limit their wages. And now we have all for the capitalists. What a nice coincidence. <laughs> Especially if you're a trade man and a politician, as Ricardo. So you did it well. You proved with the theory that you are in the best world. Um, so this was Ricardo. He liked his world. Uh, he proved with math because in this scenario, uh, the value of something is the labor you began to put on it, the labor you incorporate. is a unique measurement. He don't care too much if people want it or not. To some extent, he assumed that if it's produced because people want it, which is a strong assumption. Um, but he was happy with that. And because he reduced this extra cost, he said, well, all that extra money, uh, the capitalist can use it uh, to produce more and to be more innovative, to have surplus, and that would be great for all the economy. This is the best we can do. However, the last guy in the story is Marx. To finish uh, our little summary of political economics. Talking about that, um, these people, so basically between Smith and Marx, you can extend a little bit more before and a little bit after, is called political economics. Uh, traditionally, it was mentioned by that by Schumpeter <coughs> and by historians of economic thought. This is very important because if you are in a university that teaches history of economic thought and they are offering you a class in political economy, uh, you can be surprised in the sense you might not see anything of nowadays politics and you began to study Marx, Ricardo, and Smith. May, so, I mean, this is a valid, what happened with this and why I mentioned it, uh, in my university, they used to teach these topics and people loved to enter the advanced political economy class and then they got shocked when they saw history of Ricardo, Smith, and Marx. But well, last one, Marx. Marx said, Ricardo was right, but in the too right to be true. So he just didn't realize that price, the value you can have, is capital plus the wages. Everyone is happy with this. But uh, Marx noticed, or make it more strong, not as Ricardo, that this is not an addition. This is a distribution. This is what you produce. This is how you break the price. And where is the difference? Because Marx claimed, ha, here is the problem of capitalism. If we are not in a friendly way increasing the price, but there is a tension, it's a bargaining between the two classes, one point for this is one point less for that one. So, Capitalism, by definition, 
is conflict of classes. They are constantly fighting each other because this one is independent of these guys. And the question is, who takes it? And who takes it is even more important because um, where does value came from, following Ricardo? From the labor you incorporate. So each time for the capitalist, it would, it would be ideal to put more machines because more machines, less wage. So we began to put more machines and reduce the wages. The problem with this perspective, well, what happened in Europe? Workers got angry. They don't want to be exchanged by a machine. So for example, the people began to put shoes in the machine to destroy them. And then you got a word um, in Spanish also, saboteador. It do reference to that, sabotage the machines, put a, mach a shoe on it. People were not happy, but it makes sense for Ricardo. The problem is that it also makes sense for Marx. Um, but which is the problem? Machines that not incorporate value. Labor incorporates value. So while you are reducing this proportion, you are also reducing the value of things. And if you are reducing the value of things, you are hitting this side. So it's not just a matter of how we cut the pizza, it's a, a problem of the size of the pizza. And that's why Marx argued that because of this tendency of capitalism by itself, uh, capitalism was going to destroy. So we don't have to do anything. Capitalism will spoil by itself. We can just uh, wait and see. Um, but talking about value again, uh, Marx was also a little bit uneasy uh, with the incorporated price. Uh, because it seems odd, really, like I can spend as much time as I want and still this would be worthless. So for Marx, in con so to Smith and to Ricardo, we can exchange things, we can barter things. For Marx, uh, the money was important, the coin. He was not a real economy, he was, uh, money has a central role in the economy. And which is the role in the economy? Well, how is competition? What is competition? And what is perfect competition? That would be better. Any suggestion? If you are taking an economic class, what is competi perfect competition? Okay, a different perspective. I mean, that's part of it. That's the keyword, price takers. Perfect competition, like in nowadays jargon, would mean price takers. No one has control over the price. Um, why, the, why is the claim that it's perfect? Because if someone is selling at a higher price, you can enter, you can compete, and then the lowest price will win. So no one has control over the price because they always the lowest one will win. Does it make sense? I mean, when you think of competition, not in economics, but in any other contest, what is competition? Or even when you see it in economics. So when you go to a market, maybe not this one because it's too civilized, um, because there are other contracts going on, but you go to a market and there are two people selling orange juice. These people will say, this person will say, oh, I sell it for one pound. And the other one will say, no, 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 come here. I will sell it for 90 cents and I will give you an extra piece of juice. And the other one say, how come you reduce the price? And the other one will hit him. That is competition, basically. Okay? Competition is an active act of who wins the fight. So price taker is indeed, um, and this is from Schumpeter, perfect competition is the state of no competition. But let's go back to our competition. Uh, yep? Uh, I have read it from Schumpeter, but <coughs> I just saw a couple of pages of it. Okay. Um, but, but that's the same fact. Um, so, Mars also go for competition. 
you go to the market, yes, there are some characteristics. So when you are going to, let's say you produce some apples, you can have an idea in mind. And that idea comes from the amount of labor that you have put on it, how right it is to charge something. Because even if it's a scarcity of apples or it's a lot of apples, you have a previous idea. The scarcity, you will realize it in the market. But before you have an idea, so for example, if I ask you now, uh, I want a tuna sandwich, which one do you think is the price? You don't need to know the scarcity. You can already give me kind of an average, something. So this person comes to the market with a little basket of things he's going to sell. And he arrived to this place. Following Ricardo, this already has a value, the amount of labor that is incorporated, so it's the value that you sell it at the market. Following nowadays economics, you have to sell it because it was produced, so in equilibrium, it has to be sell, sold. Following any real marketplace that you go, uh, it's not necessarily that he's going to sell that. What or how do you know if he was successful? He was successful when someone buy it. No before, clearly not after. <laughs> so when he find a good guy, and this guy has money. That is the role of money. Money is the social judge. So it, it has some work incorporated. But in order to be validated in the market, money judge it. And money says, the society like these things, the society accept it. What happened if the judgment goes wrong? This person that did what Marx called a salto mortal, a mortal jump, well, he died in the jump. So if no money, no person. So even from this perspective, you can begin to understand the role of entrepreneurs, the risk that the entrepreneur is taking. Because he has to go to the market, and it's not evident that if I'm going to design an app nowadays, it's going to be accepted. Someone has to like it. And that someone, that social validation, is the money, physical money. So money has an important role. It's not just a way of exchange. It's not just an accountability measure. It's the one that judges. And is the one that creates this social process of saying, in the capitalist world, what we like and what we don't like. Different societies can take this decision in different ways. So for example, if there is a king, and the king decides that he loves red, well, we don't need the money. The king, by default, put the society norm. But if we have a capitalist system that is in the market, the money is the one that is coordinating all of us. Um, but. If you think of it, um, that is a Smith. So in a Smith, back to the old point, um, which is the value of things? The value of things is how much power you want to command. Which is the measure of how to command? Well, in this case, it's the coin, because people in general like coins. So you can take it. Um, Funny enough. Where, why we did this loop? Because authors like to misread each other. So which was the point of Ricardo? He read The Wealth of Nation very thoroughly. He didn't care of theory of moral sentiments. Think of Smith. Like The way they teach it normally, even in high schools, is not the, the good behavior of the baker, is not the be good behavior of the one that sells meat, the butcher. Uh, that rolled economy. Well, indeed it is, but you have to read the previous book. So the, the thing why they exchange is because of this big story, but the thing behind is this, what are we as humans and what do we like? Which are the institutions around us? What create the power structures? Then we can have that. And come and decide when you want to see the invisible hand in Smith is not in that passage, it's in the back part of the book. There are four invisible hands of Smith. He liked to mention it all the time. 
uh, he mentioned it there in the back because this is how society progress. Remember the parable of the poor man's son that everyone is blinded because he wants to be better, so he put a lot of effort. So it's like an invisible hand that makes society progress. Okay? Um, Tom and the side Smith also wore a road a place for theater. And in that case, the people that you have in front that is telling you what to say if you forget, they also work as an invisible hand. So some people believe that that's where he got the metaphor from. These people that are telling the hints. He also wrote a treaty on astronomy, and it's like the planet behave as an invisible hand. So be careful with this metaphor of invisible hand. He used it all the time. Um, back to the point, commanded. We need to like things. Um, why do I strength this point so much? Because he claims, and this is the most important, like to wrap up, that one thing is the use value. We love water, we have to drink water, it's useful for us. And another thing independent from that is the exchange value. Why do we change things? What is that unit of change? Um, longer histories can be derived from this, but as I'm wrapping up, think of economics nowadays. The value is the marginal utility, is the, unit, the happiness that gives you the last good. And the question is, well, if you are focused on an egocentric person that only likes to live for himself and that, might be, to some extent, my the value might be how much he appreciates the last unit, but that's a very particular case. And even in the things we buy in our everyday life, we usually don't apply that philosophy. So, this philosophy, the marginalist approach, how do we like to sell the last good, was very important in history of economic thought. And was important because this one depends on the individual. How much I like one glass of water? How much I like two glasses of water? A little bit less. How much I like three glasses of water? Four glasses, five glasses, six glasses. There is no society, they are individuals. Why this was important? Uh, because of Marx. Price equals capital uh, plus workers. One class fighting with another class. Then three people arrive, the marginalist revolution, Menger, Valras, and Jevons, and they say, why? We don't have to talk about classes. Uh, we talk about individuals and their utility, their use. And if we don't have classes, if we have individuals, we cannot argue like Marx because a class argument just fell down because there's no classes. So notice that even though it's an assumption, it's a very heavily political assumption in the implications. Mm. You can take the perspective you want, you can decide why diamonds are more valuable than water, but uh, it's important to see other perspectives. And most important, read the authors, because we, have been, we are getting used to read the summaries of the summaries of the summaries of the authors, and they already have some filters. Probably I create a super bias here. Uh, if you don't believe me, read the authors, read the originals. Uh, some people think that Marx thought that Ricardo refers to the incorporated price as the individual, not as the average, and that that was his critics. Well, that's one approach of reading it. But if you read that person, you can misinterpret Marx. Things like that. So yeah, my conclusion would be read the originals or misread them and write something different and then say like, ha, I proved them to be wrong. That can also work in academy. Okay, thank you. Okay, we got any questions? Yep. So, uh, what I was asking for you, personally, if I ask you, why is there more to overlap than water? What would be your defining feature or your defining characteristic uh, or factor that you would emphasize that this is what I'm listening to? Well, in my case, I'm very, I kind of follow Smith's perspective. So, if no one in the society likes diamonds, why do you like it? 
There's a historical reason that it's important, and is diamonds are hardness 9. You can cut jade. And you need jade to do imperial seals. So that's why uh, diamonds are very... I mean, the diamonds are for wealthy people that have to cut seals. So you see the connection <coughs> to prestige. Uh, but if you read, for example, Utopia from Thomas Moore, he gave a nice example that in Utopia, uh, people put gold in the toilets. And the reason why they do the toilets from gold is because they want to reduce this um, greediness. So when the ambassadors of other countries arrive with all his fancy of gold, people in Utopia say, like, why they send us their poor class? Uh, social perspective. Yep. Maybe to give a world example to what you just said. So just now it reminded me that in the middle period in, uh, in the territory, you know, that's now all the point. In some places there was a lot of salmon, and it sometimes people, people who were working for uh, a nobleman were fed salmons daily. And they and it's it's documented that some in some places they were protesting against it, and the rule was introduced that they won't eat salmon more times than X during the week. Whereas now it's treated as an exquisite fish compared to others. When then it was like this worst type of fish because people did not enjoy it as much. Mm -hmm. Yep. Good. A lot in such a short time. Uh, do you have you seen any examples of how value has been created in, in new nations, uh, nations that may have been become independent recently? But value created or defined in that sense? Sorry. Like what? What do you exactly mean by creation? So, for of value? example, the Central Asian countries uh, who became independent in the nineties. They want to create a vision for their future and they want to rely on their history. But they're, they're looking for the value in that. Okay. Yeah, so, so the trick with value is that you can use the word value to mention many things. Like from youth value, exchange value, social value, institutional value. Uh, is, that's why it's a tricky term. Um, what you might consider is if they want to create something that is worthy for all of them, that they would appreciate it as a social construct. And I can give you an example, uh, quite odd, but I have some thoughts of it recently, Egypt. Egypt after revolution uh, with Nassar, uh, when they began to create the big, um, uh, the big Aswan Dam, it was a project to promote their industrialization. We are now free, we have now this democracy, or whatever it is in this case, uh, we can build a dam. So it was imp like a physical construction that they were given a lot of social value because it means the standard of the revolution. And was it the political leadership? Which institution pushed for that? In that case, it was a little bit of everything because it was after revolution. So, okay. um, But you can have a also a other type of values. A, I mean, as social constructs. Explicitly talking about social constructs. Um, let me think of uh, the white dress in marriage. That was very unlikely. It was, if I'm not wrong, but double check it. Uh, it was after Queen Victoria that white dress became used uh, in marriages, in weddings. And the reason is if the queen has a white dress, the rich people want to have a white dress because they want to look like the queen. And then the maids and workers of the rich people, they want to be like the rich people, so they want to use also white dress. And it became institutionalized. And you can have a strong value for it, not for purity, not for chastity or whatever, uh, the queen uses it. Back to your Aswan Dam convention, um, are you saying that that is a reflection of the universalization of global um, standards of value in the sense that so that Egypt was specifically replicating this universal idea of what it is to have value by creating these grand public works and projects? No, it was a social decision that they like to put in front. 
So we are, like, we are going to show that we have this industrial power with this construction. But all these, all these terms are context specific. Because what a society can value, the other one can be like, take it for granted. Uh, so, sorry, we, we do have to wrap up now, but if you want to just ask your question uh, afterwards, that's fine. So, let's just thank Nicholas again. Thank you.